All right, church, this morning we continue on. Genesis chapters 37 and 39 we're going to look at today. This is the life of Joseph in the beginning. We're going to take a look at Joseph, uh, who he is, a um, little bit of his um, just a little bit of his family history, uh, Joseph, the son of Jacob, as we talked this morning with our little kids, that Jacob's other name, Israel, changed by God so that, so that he would remember that he wrestled with God and that God came out victorious. As we see Joseph, we, Joseph falls in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And what's significant about this is that the Abrahamic covenant was given to Abraham, Joseph's uh, great-granddad. Then the promises, the covenantal promises of God passed from Abraham on to Isaac, from Isaac on to Jacob, and now we'll see, see God's plan starting to unfold for young Joseph and what all of that means. So before we do that, we want to, uh, as, we, as we do every time we are together, we're going to read through a passage of Scripture this morning. This will be uh, Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 5. And church, if we would, because God is so good and His Word is perfect, let's all together worship God standing together to read His Word. We don't have to read aloud, just follow along on the screen. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to open up to Genesis chapter 37. Check that out, Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Uh, not too Difficult to find there. Flip through till you find 37. If you need a copy, physical copy of the Bible, there's some available back in the lobby. We'd love to have you grab one of those um, for this morning or on your way out. But let's read this uh, together here this morning. Genesis chapter 37, verse 5 starts like this. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept that saying in mind. Church, this is God's holy word. Let's pray together. Father, you are great, magnificent, and your word is true, is awesome. Thank you for giving us your word that we might know you even more. Holy Father, would you be with us this morning? Might we see your word come to life in a brand new way through revelation of your spirit. In our lives, may you work in us, through us. May May we realize areas in our lives where we, we might need to repent and come running to you. Father, be glorified today in the words that are spoken, in the thoughts that we have, and in the lives that we live. Would you be glorified today? We pray this in the mighty, holy, wonderful, and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Church, thank you. Would you be seated this morning? This morning, we'll look at the God whose plan, and I spelled who's wrong again, uh, plan involves suffering. Genesis 37 and 39, we're not going to dig into Genesis 38. I'll let you do that on your own. Um, just know there's some wild, wacky stuff happening in Genesis 38. Um, we're going to skip over that gladly this morning. If you really want to know uh, more about that, you can see Kevin Love. He's going to do a, a dissection. No, I'm kidding. Um, we'll we're just going to hit on 37, 39, the highlights here of Joseph in his early uh, life. Joseph is, is uh, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel. He's actually number 11 in line. What is making that significant is that Joseph being the almost youngest child of Jacob, is favored by Jacob. 
That's his favorite son. And again, going against the Jewish tradition and culture, which typically would see the oldest son favored and carry out the family heritage, we saw God at work going against culture already in, in the accounts of, of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was the youngest son of Isaac, younger than Esau. And Esau, who came out first, was the oldest by just a couple of minutes, if that. But Jacob came out, remember, grabbing the heel of Esau. Therefore, he was named Jacob. And Jacob, the name Jacob means he who cheats or the deceiver. See, even from the womb, he wanted to come out. He wanted to come out first or at the same time, so he grabbed on in order to try to make that happen. As they grew up, Jacob and Esau, uh, Isaac found favor with Esau. Rebekah, his mother, found favor with the younger son, Jacob. Why is that all important? Because we see God's plan go against culture's plan. We see God say, your culture can't bind me. I am the Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I am Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. So we have this start to unfold before us now, more of the family lineage, family drama, if you will, in the lineage of Abraham, the one who, who had God's covenant established with him. And the covenant saying to Abraham, Behold, I will, I will make your sons and daughters more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. If you can count them, that's how many you're going to have. And kings will come, right? We see this played out through these these three generations. Kings will come from your lineage, from your generations, from your loins, as some translations say. Your family will be a royal heritage. And what is important in that is that not just did kings of Israel come from this lineage, but the king of kings has come from this lineage, from this family heritage. Jesus himself, born of the lineage of Abraham. Jacob has these 12 sons. Jacob's other name being Israel, having 12 sons. Any connection to anything there? Maybe 12 tribes that are to come and be formed of Israel? Call it a coincidence, if you want. I actually call it God's sovereign plan. Joseph in this point, we're picking this up. And Joseph being favored by his father, Jacob. The, the ten older brothers and the youngest brother, they don't, they don't like this. They, they don't like Jacob because of the favor that, or they don't like Joseph because of the favor that Jacob shows to him. It makes them jealous. It makes them burn with rage. What is, what is the parallel in this? Jacob's older brother burned with rage against Jacob and jealousy. Start to see parallels even more so start to unfold. God's covenant plan being put into place. So the other brothers don't like him already as it is. And we just, we read uh, scripture already this morning to see uh, uh, what that means, what that looks like, I should say. And so J Joseph, given Two dreams. He's given a dream uh, first that um, they're binding sheaves in the field. And he says that his rose up in his dream. His stood up on its own. This inanimate object now stands amongst all of the others. And it happens to belong to Joseph. And all of the other sheaves then get up and they bow down before it. And a sign of submission they bow before Joseph's. And the, and the dream interpretation is that is Joseph standing there as his sheep represents. And the brothers all gathered around him and they bow in submission to him. Then he had another dream. 
He says, I've dreamed another dream that the sun, the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to me. They bowed down to me in this dream. And what was the reaction of his brothers? Gosh, this guy, he just never stops. We hate this guy. That's what they're saying. Can you believe the nerve of number 11 here? Jumping up to say that, that not just once, but twice, two dreams, that, that we will bow before him? Who does he think he is? That's not our culture. The generations had not yet learned that God doesn't care about culture. He's not bound by what culture dictates. Verse 11 says his brothers were jealous of him. They're jealous of the favor that he has shown and they're jealous of these dreams that he keeps having. That the dreams um, are being interpreted that, that yes, his, his brothers, his entire family, his brothers, his mother, his father would bow before him. So this, this jealousy is now building up deeper and deeper inside of him. And in verse 12, we see that the brothers go out into the field to tend to the flocks. And what's happening in, these, in this, this passage is they're gone. Joseph is behind. He's left behind. So Israel, his father, says, says, go see where your brothers are. Go see how they're doing. So he does. Takes off. He goes toward the, toward the brothers, knowing what direction... They're in. He finds a man in wandering, or a man found him wandering in the fields looking for his brother. He says, where are you going? What are you seeking? What is it that you, that you look for? And he says, hey, I'm looking for, for my brothers. Have you seen them? They're pasturing some flocks around here. And the guy says, yeah, go. They went this way. They went to Dothan. He says, okay, sweet. Let's go to Dothan. So he's continuing on this path. Why? He's being obedient to the direction of his father. He's supposed to go see how they're doing. As he's coming along the way to where his brothers are, they see him approaching. Now keep in mind, these are the brothers that, that do not already like him. And they see him coming. When you see someone coming that you don't like, what is your immediate response? Nobody wants to really admit it, but let's be honest, we all go, this guy's coming. Great. Now I'm going to have to deal with him. Now I've got to talk to this person that I don't like. Brothers, probably having similar but more more rage pent up in what they're saying, they get together. The brothers get together and they say, here comes this dreamer. This dreamer. The word that they used here, it's, it's a comment and it's full of sarcasm. The Hebrew expression means the master of dreams. Here comes this master of all dreams, the guy that's dreamed two dreams that we'll all bow before him. What are we going to do with him? said, let's kill him. Here's a great idea. Here comes, here comes our younger brother. Let's kill him and throw him in a pit. Sound like fun? Sound like some dudes you want to hang out with? Here comes a guy we don't like. Let's just kill him and be done with it. But Reuben, the oldest brother, heard it and he said, let's not take his life. Let's not do this. Let's, let's not have murder on our hands. We've got jealousy coming into play already, right? We have rage being fueled by hatred for the brother, Joseph. We have Reuben trying to be the, the voice of reason to the brothers in what is going on in this situation. And, and he says, let's not take his life. He said, shed no blood. Throw him into the pit. 
but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben, Reuben's desire is to go back and rescue his brother at a later time without his other brothers around. He wants to be earning favor with his father. What, we've, what we have in the meantime what's happening is this jealousy and there is about to be some massive deception brought into play. And what happens is that jealousy and deception, church, they're always ingredients in persecution. Jealousy and deception are always leading into a life of persecution. Look at what, what they go on to say in verse um, 24. They actually take him, they threw him into the pit. And the pit was empty. And they sat down to eat. They just threw their brother into a pit to leave him, he, leave him there to die. And they're like, you know what? I'm hungry. Let's grub. So they sit down to eat. And as they look up during their meal, they see, they see a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Key point in this passage they're headed towards Egypt. Then Judah, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him. He's our brother. He's our own flesh. And his brothers, Judah's brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by. They drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. What's going on is jealousy and deception all at play. Here's, here are his brothers scheming to kill him. And you know that they're going to have to come up with something. They're going to have to tell their dad something. What has happened? I sent Joseph out to you. Did he, you can imagine, like, did he find you? Did he ever make it? He's, he went out to see where you are. The brothers, the brothers are saying, we, just, we don't like him well enough. We, we just want to kill him. We're going to leave him here for dead. We'll come up with something to tell dad when we get home. Any of you with siblings, have you ever tried to, to do something, especially if you're the older sibling? I don't know anything about this. You try to come up with a plan to do something to your younger sibling, and you're like, I'm just going to tell mom and dad something else. Or maybe it was a friend that you had. Like, I don't know, they were here, and now they're gone. Where they went, I don't know, they were, my, 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 my brother and my sister was fine when I checked on them last. Now they're not. They come up with stories. We, that's what's happening here. They're, they're, they're devising in their head what's going on. See, what, happened, we, we, what people don't like and don't understand, they cast out of their lives. And in this situation of persecution that's happening, this is the, the God whose plan involves suffering. This persecution leads to suffering of some sort and what people don't like, what people do not understand, they take and they throw it out of their lives. Our gut instinct is not to try to understand it more, to try to see where someone's coming from in their point of view. Our gut instinct is, I don't like you, I don't like what you're saying, I don't understand what you're saying, get away from me. Let me just surround myself with like-minded people. Do we ever grow when we're surrounded with just like-minded people and we're never challenged? How can we possibly grow? We can't. We can't. But look, our, our gut instinct, the flesh, says to just get rid of that that opposes us. And what we're about to see the brothers have done that. What we're also about to see here is that Jacob is about to be deceived. Jacob the deceiver, the one who cheats, is about to be deceived by those who he loves, his sons. There's deception play in today's world we see 
persecution happening. Turn on the news and it will smack you in the face. Persecution happens. It happens to different degrees based on where you are in the world. And even here, in, in our country, persecution happens not necessarily to the point of death like in other nations. We're cast out as Christians. People don't understand the gospel. They don't understand Yahweh. So what's the easiest thing to do? Write it off. It doesn't matter. I don't like it. Get it out of here. Cast it out. And then those who do follow what is not understood are looked down upon. They're called names. They're kicked out of places. See in uh, in some other areas, especially in areas of the Middle East, Christians aren't just kicked out; they're killed. What's the easiest way to get rid of something? You kill it. What's the easiest way to get rid of of pests? You exterminate. Why is that? Because they don't understand. They don't want understand what we don't like we cast out what we don't understand we get rid of there's there's deception and false religions look at why in the middle east so much persecution happens it's deception it's a tool of the enemy false religions are all around us This may not sit well, but false religions exist in the church and the body of Christ as well. Do we not, do we not fall prey to things that we hold in a little bit higher place in our life? We fall prey to things like traditions. If you really want to get some folks worked up, get rid of a tradition that's been long-rooted. We fall prey to that. Is that a false religion? We have legalism that happens. You, you can only be a Christian if you do this. Your life only, only can be uh, a Christ following if you display these certain characteristics. You have to dress a certain way. You have to act a certain way. You have to talk a certain way. Otherwise, what are we telling you? You're not. You are not in Christ. Pharisaical, we see that. New Testament, Jesus dealt with that. We deal with it today. We have to watch out. There's deception around every corner. We twist, we have twistings of God's word. So we we have what seems to be good, what seems to be God-centered. It's twisted. Is that deception? Absolutely it is. We have things that look like they are of God. But in reality, when we, when we put it to the test, and this, church, this is the test. When we put it to the test, it turns out that it is not of God. It is a, it is a man-made twist on something. In our Bible study group this morning, we talked about this. We'll hit on this again right here. When we, when we have things that, that look like they are of God, they don't hold up to his word. It is a false religion. Prosperity gospel. That is deception. It does not line up with God's word. Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. You don't rub a bottle, out comes Jesus, and he grants you three wishes. Jesus doesn't say, come to me and I will make you wealthy beyond belief on this earth. No, you know what he says? Come to me and you will be hated on this earth. Blessed are those that are hated in my name. Does that sound like you're going to be rich? Jesus himself. Birds of the air have nests. Foxes have holes. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. If there was ever to be a human blessed with the riches of this earth, would it not have been the very Son of God Himself? 
and his closest followers, they were 14. Put it to the litmus test of the Word of God. We have books that people go and read because they look like they're doing great service and glory to the name of God. When in fact, they do not. Church, we have to take caution on what we take in. Be careful of what we say would glorify God when it goes against His Word. We have books that are full of mysticism, universalist principles. Those are not biblical but they're popular and they've sold millions of copies. Why? Because they put the name of God or the name of Jesus somewhere in it. Therefore, it must be good. No. No. It can't be if it goes against the Word of God. Jealousy and deception are always ingredients in persecution. If, if we were to stand and start to talk more in depth of some of these resources that we have that that people fall for. I guarantee you, calling out that deception would lead to persecution. If we were to call out names of prosperity gospel preachers, people say, wait, I, I watch him. I watch him on TV all the time. He's good. No, he's not. And neither is his message. If you want to be deceived, turn on TBN. The Bible Network. Pay close attention to the message that's given throughout those shows. Not to say there aren't quality on there. There, there are sometimes. The overall message leads to a prosperity gospel message. You say, wait a minute. Name is the Bible Network. Not my Bible. Be very cautious that just because something looks good doesn't mean that it is. There's persecution to be had. Church, we're in the midst of trying times and persecution. Jealousy rages from outside of the church toward the church and from inside the church to inside the church and outside the church. Jealousy takes over. It's an ingredient in persecution. People don't like or understand, they cast out. Next thing we see, flipping forward to Genesis chapter 39. Let's see this. The children of God will be persecuted for standing on principles of righteousness. What happens here? Joseph's already sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Keep that in mind for a little bit later. He's sold into slavery. So now he's in Egypt. He's, he's established in Egypt. Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh. He's a captain of the guard. Pharaoh's a king of Egypt. He's set up in a, in a, in a high, um, high-ranking position with a high-ranking officer. And the Lord blessed Joseph. He, he was with him. And we see that Joseph stood on principles of righteousness. We see this because God was with him. God blessed him. God allowed him to succeed in his position that he was in. Joseph was a high-ranking slave. A Hebrew slave amongst Egyptians. Foreshadowing to what is to come in the book of Exodus. So here's Joseph. He's set up as, as the man. He is the number two guy in the house of Potiphar. The number one guy is Potiphar himself. And here's Joseph coming in. Potiphar entrusts everything in his house under, into the care of Joseph. Everything that he owns, Joseph is a steward of. What we dig into, we see this in verse 7. After a time, his master, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes on Joseph. And said, lie with me. It's 
exception. He refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's not, he is not greater in this house than I am not, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He's not so much concerned about sinning against Potiphar. He's more concerned about his sin before a holy and righteous God. Church, if we would only take on that mindset, imagine how different things would be. He goes on and says, and and as, as she spoke to Joseph, Day after day. Here's this deception. Here's this trial. Here's this trivialization. Do this. Every day. Do this. Come on. Come to me. Hey, hey, this is, this is going to be good. Come on. Let's do this. Day after day. And Joseph says, no. If I do that, I sin against my God. My God has established me in this place, in this position, to serve Potiphar If I do that, I sin against God. Big picture. One day he went into the house to do his work. None of the men of the house were there in the house. Problem number one. She caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and fled, got out of the house. And as soon as as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the man of her household, said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. She told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Children of God will be persecuted for standing on principles of righteousness. What is Joseph doing here? He is standing on his principles, the principles given to him by his God. And what is happening? Somebody doesn't like it. So they don't like that you're standing on what you believe. You should do what I want you to do. She is now creating deception. She's created a situation of deception that leads to persecution of Joseph. She is Jealous and proud, she was turned down by Joseph. She doesn't like it. She won't have it. So she's going to do what she can do to have him punished for it. Church, this is a theme that is so relevant throughout all of Scripture and all of life today. Here's Joseph trying to do the right thing, and there's someone trying to just absolutely destroy him. Out of pride, she tries to destroy Joseph. And we see persecution come into play for people standing on principles of righteousness. Let's look at the life of Job. Anybody read through Job? That's a great, uplifting book of the Bible. You learn how to be a great friend through the book of Job. Basically, don't do anything that Job's friends did, and you'll be a great friend. Job was found to have favor in the eyes of God, yet he was allowed to face trials to the glory of God. When we see what happens, we we get an amazing peek behind the curtain of what goes on with Job. We have dialogue in Scripture, in Job chapter 1, of Yahweh himself, Talking with Satan. There's discussion happening. Job had 
great character. He was a man of great wealth. And he was a man of great faith. And so here comes this, this gathering, this meeting, this, this heavenly get-together. What a great, this is a great little picture of what is happening. In Job chapter 1, it says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Can you imagine being a witness to what's going on here? The sons of God, the angels of God, all of the heavenly celestial beings coming together to gather around God. And who shows up? Satan. Why does Satan show up? Look at who Satan is. He's a former son of God. He was once in the faint. He is an angel of God who has fallen. And he was allowed there at the time. So where have you been? Satan says, oh, I've been, I've been roaming around the earth. I've been roaming around the people that you created going to and fro and walking up and down on it. If that phrase right there doesn't catch our attention, church, we should read that part again. Satan himself on earth, walking on earth, getting mixed up in the things of the earth. And so God says, hey, um, I know what you're doing when you go there. Have you, have you thought about my man, Job. Satan's like, hmm. I like that. God says, there's none like him on the earth. There's not one like him on the earth. He is blameless and upright. He fears God. He turns away from evil. Satan says, does he fear God for no reason? Have you put a hedge around him? Put a hedge around his house. He's protected from every angle. You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased. Stretch out your hand. Touch all that he has. And he will curse you to your face, Satan tells God. And God says, no. Go try it. Job has no idea this is going on. Here's a man that's upright in the eyes of God. Favored in the eyes of God. Upright. None like him, God says. Imagine having that compliment paid to you by the creator of all things. There's none like you in all the earth. Blameless and upright. Watch what happens for my glory. I give Satan this authority. Satan couldn't touch him if God, God didn't give him permission. We need to realize Satan is not Sovereign. He is not omnipotent. God is sovereign and allows this to happen. Why? For his glory. He says, go. All that he has is in your hand, but you can't touch him. You can take away everything that, that Job owns. You can take away all of his blessings, all of his possessions. You can take away his family, but you can't touch him. Satan's like, sweet, I got this. This is no problem. So what happens? All that he has is taken away. His family is taken away. His possessions are taken away. And his God is not taken away. Satan attacks Job over and over. Finally, Satan's like, okay, this isn't working. I need more. I need more, God. What else can I do? He said, that's fine. Go, go to him. You can touch him, but you can't kill him. So Satan gives him disease, these boils. Job, we see Job taking shards of pottery, scraping the boils off. He's in so much pain. Why did this happen? Because God allowed it, and it's for God's glory. Standing on the principles of righteousness is Job, and cast out is Job. Persecuted is Job. Punished is Job. We see the introduction of his 
three friends in the, in the end of chapter 2. And his friends are just a peach. And if they're not good enough, then here comes his beautiful bride and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Thanks, babe. Love you too. Job says, I'm not going to do it. Because in the midst of all of this, my God is still good. My God is still sovereign. My God still deserves my praise. I will stand on my principles of righteousness that my God has given to me. Yahweh has instilled upon me. I will stand on Him alone. If Job, there was none like him, faced this kind of persecution, who do we think we are that we would not face We need to rest in knowing that we will face persecution of some sort, but rest in the fact that we will be blessed for it. If we stand on the principles of righteousness, we will be blessed by God Himself for the fact that we have stood. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You know how the book of Psalms starts out. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is the man who does not keep company of wicked people and and bow to their influences, but stands on the very word and instruction and law of God. This doesn't say that we shouldn't associate with people who don't know God. It says that if we do that, we still stand on God's principles. We stand on His word. Too many times we, we get caught up in the fact we should only be surrounded by churchy folk. Church, if we do that, who's going to go tell those who don't have Jesus about Jesus? Is, can that happen? It doesn't mean that we don't have church friends. I love my church family. I love my church friends. But we also have to embrace the world outside of the church for the sake of the Great Commission being carried out. How are they to know Jesus if they don't see Jesus and hear of Jesus? They need to see Jesus in us, standing on the principles of righteousness, and hear of Jesus from our mouth. As we keep going, keep going through this account 29, 30, uh, uh, 39, sorry, 21 and 23. So the Potiphar comes home, wife tells him, Potiphar throws him in prison. Throws Joseph in prison and says, I'm not going to have this in my house. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Here's Joseph again in an odd situation, but finding favor in God and, and being elevated by God into an interesting position. He found favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge over all the prisoners. We just saw Joseph sold into slavery and being the head man of Potiphar's house, the, 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 control, the captain of the guard of Egypt. Now he's put in prison by Potiphar, and the, and, the, and the warden says, I like this dude. I'm going to put him in charge of all the prisoners. Makes my job a whole lot easier because I think I can trust him. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Joseph is found to be in God's favor while in the grips of persecution and suffering. Joseph found to be in, the, in God's favor while he rests in the persecution and suffering that he's encountered. What can we say? We can say rightly that God blesses suffering in the name of righteousness. Here is Joseph. We see 
We see accounts of Joseph. We see accounts of David. We see accounts of Jesus himself. We see Paul suffering for the sake of the gospel and their efforts being blessed because they stand in righteousness. Look at a few passages of Scripture. Matthew 5.10 Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what does this say? If you're persecuted for the sake of God's righteousness, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. What does it say without saying? Oh, if you don't stand on righteousness and you give in, what happens? You don't get the kingdom of heaven. We see 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. That's what Paul's saying here. You're going to face all kinds of garbage. But let Jesus shine through you in the midst of the garbage. We always carry in our body the death of Jesus. What is significant about the death of Jesus? It was the pay- payment of the penalty of our sin. It's Christ's righteousness. It's Christ going to the cross in the, sake, in the face of persecution and standing boldly so that he might be manifested in our body. James 1, 2. What do we do in all of this? We count it joy. We count it all joy, James says, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Persecution, staring down the, staring down the barrel of an AK-47 in a foreign land because you are a Christian does not sound like joy. But why are you facing that persecution? For the sake of Christ. What is the joy? It doesn't mean that we do cartwheels and we say, yes, I'm going to be killed. It says, oh, but Jesus is this good. James 5, 11 and 13. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. There's Job again. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. What do we do in the midst of our suffering? Various degrees of suffering. What's our first response? Is it to pray? Or is it to complain? Are we whiners? Or are we prayers? Are we glorifiers? And what do we do when we're cheerful? Do we pat ourselves on the back? Or do we sing the praises of God? What we have in this, in this picture of Joseph so far, just, just so far in the life of Joseph, we have parallels of what Joseph is facing to what Jesus faced. Parallels to Joseph being favored in the eyes of his father. Was Jesus favored in the eyes of his father? I hope so. And I hope you know that. We have Joseph's suffering at the hands of those closest to him and being betrayed. Was Jesus betrayed by those closest to him and forced to suffer? Yes. Joseph was a slave, yet he earned favor with those whom he would grow close to. Was Jesus a slave? What did he say? The Son of Man came to serve, not be served. He earned favor. Jesus earned favor with those he was closest to. Joseph earns favor with those he's closest to. Joseph tempted to sin, yet withstood the trial. Was Jesus tempted to sin ever? Yes. Constantly, right? But especially Matthew 4. Read that. Jesus in the wilderness. Here's Satan himself coming to tempt, to tempt and to test Jesus. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, you ain't getting me today. He's persecuted for the sake of of righteousness. Lies were told about Joseph that made authority figures angry at him. Were lies told about Jesus that made the authority figures angry at him? 
Yes. Wrongfully imprisoned. Wrongfully imprisoned. In the Bible, what we have is this thing called a type, a typology, a type type of Jesus. This doesn't mean that he is a, a um, pre-manifestation of Jesus himself. It means that Joseph, Joseph's life parallels that of Jesus and points us to Jesus. We see the characteristics of Christ played out in certain people throughout Scripture. And these parallels are not coincidence. They are divine parallels. They're uncanny. Joseph is to be the key deliverer of God's people. He has a, he has a scrape with death only to be glorified. This is foreshadowing Christ as the final deliverer. Joseph, in wanting to stay faithful and true to his God, took whatever came his way. He took it in stride. Jesus, in staying faithful to Yahweh, Abba, Father, took his persecution in stride to the glory of God. What do we do when we face trials? When times get tough, do we abandon ship? Or do we ride it out? As we close out this morning, our points of application, how do we, how do we worship regardless of our circumstances? Yahweh always remains worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise. He is good no matter what we're facing. An old Baptist cliche that we love, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. That's so true. It doesn't matter what He does to us or allows us to go through. He's always good and always worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. In our relationship with Him, we rejoice in suffering. We rest peacefully knowing that God, not that God is suffering, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's in, he's in total and complete control of all things. At any minute, He could end all life on this earth. He could destroy this earth. He could destroy the entire universe if He wanted to. That's how sovereign our God is. And serving Jesus includes listening to and submitting to His commands. And that may mean that you get uncomfortable. It may mean that he rips the comforts of this life out from under you. It might mean that he takes away air conditioning. It might mean that he takes away padded seats for a moment. Or a building. I've mentioned before here that, that God blessed me so much to be able to, to, to be in other nations, to worship with brothers and sisters, to know that God can be glorified under a mango tree in West Africa just the same as he can be glorified in a beautiful building in the United States of America. He's the same. And that serving Jesus means that we submit. When he says go, we go. When he says talk to this person, we talk to this person. And when he says lay down your life to me, we lay our lives down. Church, let's pray. Father, thank you you for your grace the grace god that you've given to us to allow us to be in your grips and in your family